We'll now move on to our next presentation, which will be from Ron Saunders, Director of Knowledge Transfer and Exchange, or KTE, at the Institute for Work and Health, based in Ontario. Ron will discuss the approach to knowledge transfer and exchange and the measurement of research impact at the IWH. So again, if you have questions, please go ahead and ask them in the chat box. We'll address them as we can, and otherwise we'll hold them until the end. Welcome, Ron. Are you ready to start? I am. Thank you, Joan. Thank you. Okay, so indeed I'm going to talk about our approach to knowledge transfer and exchange and measuring research impact. Um, uh, the Institute for Work and Health is a nonprofit uh, research organization based in Toronto, Canada. I'm going to talk in a moment uh, uh, very briefly about what we do. Uh, I just do want to say at the outset that um, these slides were developed in collaboration with my colleague Dwayne Van Aird of the Institute, uh, but uh, I'm going to be the only one speaking today, but Dwayne and I have worked together on this. Um, so what I'm going to talk about um, in the next little while, uh, as I said, briefly, uh, just to give you a sense of, of um, who we are and what we do, and then most of the time I'm going to be talking about the approach that we've developed really over a couple of decades, um, uh, particularly in the last decade, uh, to um, doing integrated, what we call knowledge transfer and exchange, or what Chris referred to as integrated knowledge translation, um, uh, you know, how, how we've uh, developed that approach uh, and, and the key pillars of that approach at the Institute for Work and Health. Um, and one of the features of it at the Institute, being a research organization, that we've been able to integrate both communications functions and stakeholder engagement functions in the same unit. And I'm going to explain a bit about some of the synergies we've been able to get by doing that. Um, and then lastly, given the, the, the one of the themes of of this conference is about measuring impact. I'm going to talk a little bit about how we have approached uh, the measurement of reach and impact. And I'll explain what I mean by those two terms and how we've approached those two things. Um, so that's sort of just a, a preview of uh, what I'm going to cover in the next um, 40 minutes or so. I'll try to leave some time for questions after. Um, so the Institute is a nonprofit research organization that's really focused on two types of research, but all of which related to work and health of, of, of working people, but, um, but, but in two um, separate but related areas. One of them is research and knowledge exchange around the prevention of work-related injury and illness, so looking at what are the factors that have been found to increase the risk of work injury or, or, or occupational illness? Um, what interventions have been found to be helpful in preventing or reducing the incidence of, of work injury or illness? So that's one domain. Um, and the second domain that we work in is, in the event of work injury, what do you do? Um, and so we, we do work around return to work protocols, around workers' compensation systems, and we also do a little bit of research. It used to be a bigger part of the Institute's work, but we do a little bit of research around uh, issues related to the treatment of certain kinds of uh, work injury. So those are the areas in which uh, IWH does research. Um, and I think it's helpful to know before we get into a discussion of how we approach knowledge transfer and exchange, who, who is it that our users or potential users of our research, who are our stakeholders or knowledge users, and, um, and it's really quite a range of people and organizations that could be involved in worker health and safety issues. Um, so that ranges from individual um, health and safety practitioners, that could be in-house consultants, it could be consultants brought in from other organizations. Um, certainly workplace parties themselves, um, so representatives of management, of the workers, um, uh, injured worker associations, employer associations, so all those groups that are related to the workplace parties who are on the front lines of, of trying to prevent work injury and illness. Policy makers, so workers' compensation boards, um, ministries of labor in particular in Canada that have, um, that have a responsibility for the regulation of occupational health and safety uh, uh, in workplaces. Um, 
a little bit of, uh, of uh, work we still do related to clinical treatment, as I said, but also some of our work around return to work protocols is of interest to clinical practitioners, physiotherapists, and the other ones mentioned on this slide, a variety of clinical practitioners that we still connect with around our work. And, uh, and because of our work, not only in injury prevention, but on disability management, disability prevention, we also interact with um, those involved in the prevention of work disability and, or management of work disability in the event of work injury. There's one group I, and that, that may be implicit in some of the individuals named here, but I should have added to the slide, and that is that um, because we do a lot of collaboration with them, and that would be health, what are called in, in Ontario, Canada, um, health and safety associations, who are uh, nonprofit organizations that do um, that provide consulting services and training programs for workplaces in Ontario uh, around the prevention of work injury and illness. Um, um, and, and in fact, they are an important intermediary for us because although some of our work in, in some of our work, we're directly connecting with workplace parties. Um, often, we are reaching workplaces through intermediaries, like the health and safety associations. We work with them. We hope that they find our research useful and, and, and uh, use it to inform their advice to workplaces. And we reach workplaces indirectly sometimes through intermediaries like them. Um, OK. so. Um, so at the Institute, um, one of the things that we try to do is integrate knowledge transfer and exchange in, in all of our work and promote integrated KTE in our research projects. Um, and uh, we have a team that's dedicated to that. So we have a team within the organization that's dedicated to the stakeholder engagement function, stakeholder relationship building functions, as well as communications functions. And I'll, I'll elaborate on that in just a moment. Um, our, our goal, the goal, the overall goal of um, our um, KTE program at the Institute is to make relevant research evidence accessible through interactive engagement with specific audiences to help inform practice planning and policy making. Um, I've read that all of that, and we because we choose those words um, carefully. Um, uh, so, for example, relevant research, that speaks to one of the things that Chris McBride just talked about, that um, we're not interested in doing research for academic purposes only. We're primarily interested in doing research that can be used to prevent, to help prevent um, work injury and illness or reduce the incidence of work injury and illness or help with um, uh, the prevention of work disability. and. Um, so, so we want our research to be relevant to those who can possibly use it. Um, and I'll talk in a moment about some of the processes we use in order to try to make that happen. So we want it to be relevant. We want it to be accessible. That means communicated in language that is usable. Um, um, and we do that in part through an interactive process with our stakeholders, um, uh, working with them around our research processes, our, our development of our, our messages, and so on, uh, which I'm going to be coming to in more detail in just a moment. So uh, just to give you an idea of how we're organized, um, the KTE group at the Institute, um, uh, the key thing, as I said before, is that we actually bring together the communications function and the stakeholder engagement function in the same organizational unit. So we have people who are primarily one or the other, but there's a lot of crosstalk between the two. Um, you know, the communications side of the shop is, um, and this is going to be simplifying it a bit, but is largely um, concerned with um, helping us reach broad audiences, helping us extend our reach, uh, increase the range of our reach, increase the number of people who are looking at our, at our work. Um, and we do that through a variety of vehicles, website, newsletters, uh, social media, um, and so on. Um, and, and then the stakeholder engagement part of the team um, is, um, is uh, concerned primarily with building relationships, ongoing relationships with representatives of stakeholder groups who can, 
uh, use our work and work with us to help make our work more relevant um, and to support our scientists in engaging those representatives of our key stakeholders in the research process. And again, I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about that in a bit more detail um, in, in a few minutes. Um, so we have those two sort of functional areas in, in, in the one um, unit. Um, there are four pillars to our overall approach to KTE, um, sort of four areas of activity um, that we work in um, sort of at the same time, and we found working in all of them um, uh, helps the others. So that is, each of those to some degree provides um, um, benefits in terms of the other objectives that are implicit on that list. Um, and I'm going to be talking in a little bit of de detail about each one in turn in just a moment. Um, I should say that we talk about this as an approach, as an organizational approach, and not a model. Um, and we sort of have deliberately referred to it that way because we see um, that the specifics of um, how you would use the approach in any given project or context vary so much by the specific context uh, of that project or that relationship that we, 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 we tend to think of it not as a model but, but a, as an overarching, appro a guiding approach rather than a, a kind of model or formula that you can follow in different contexts. Um, so, um, so I'm just going to briefly mention each of the four and then we're going to look in more detail at how we deal with each of these four pillars. Um, foundational, I would say, is the first one. Um, building stakeholder relationships and networks. So I think foundational to all of our work is trying to build an ongoing relationship with um, influential representatives of all of our stakeholder communities. All of the ones that I mentioned in that earlier slide, we try to connect with representatives of those groups on a more or less regular basis, some more frequently than others, but we, we try to connect with them um, outside the confines of particular research projects. So I'm, in a moment, I'm going to talk about how we try to do integrated KTE in research projects. But w when I talk about building relationships, we're, we're, what we try to do is have regular dialogue with our stakeholders that is outside the confines of a particular research project. It's a dialogue about um, what, are they, what issues are they seeing in their work. Um, what recent work ha are, have we done that may be across multiple projects that we think um, may be of use uh, to them? Um, so building uh, those relationships, as I say, is kind of foundational to everything else. Um, and it makes the other three easier to do, the extent to which we do the first piece well. Um, that second piece is, is along the lines of what Chris was talking about, you know, integrated KT or KTE, um, building stakeholder engagement into the research process. So you're not just engaging people at the dissemination stage, but, but from the beginning, ideally before the beginning. Um, and I'll come back to that in a moment too, because I'm going to, I have a slide that, that sort of takes, takes us through the various stages of the research process and the different places in which stakeholder and ways in which st stakeholder engagement in it um, may occur. Um, um, the third piece, um, enhancing the capacity of our audiences to use our evidence. Uh, so I'm going to I'll talk a bit about different things we try to do to build the capacity of our stakeholders to put our evidence to use and to participate in our research processes. Um, and then uh, finally, the communication part. You know, the developing uh, tools, techniques. Um, modes of communication that facilitate um, the dissemination and application of our of our research, um, make it easy to access and apply. Um, so that's a that's a kind of outline, and then I'm going to talk, talk a bit more about these uh, four pillars. Um, so, oh, what do you know? I forgot that this is lovely animated, but we'll move to the next slide. Um, uh, so, uh, well, that's just a sort of graphical depiction of these, of the four pillars and the fact that um, they kind of um, 
feed off each other to some extent. And we think of our overall approach as, as the combination of, uh, of these four pillars, that we need to be active in all of them in order to achieve our, our KTE um, goals. Um, so, uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about, um, in a little bit more detail now, about each of the four. Um, uh, so in terms of building relationships, you know, I've talked about how that's foundational. Um, so we, we try to have, um, well, we have formed um, networks um, with each of our, uh, of our stakeholder groups. So um, if, if, you know, if you think of that earlier slide, workplace parties, health and safety associations, policymakers, clinical practitioners. So we have, uh, we've identified people in each of those communities who are um, champions of the use of research evidence uh, to inform policy or practice. And, um, and, we, uh, and we meet with each of them separately, so uh, you know, as separate um, uh, sort of stakeholder communities. Sometimes we bring them together to promote sort of inter-stakeholder dialogue. Um, but we, uh, for the most part, meet with them separately um, to, to discuss their ideas about improving knowledge exchange, their ideas about future you know, research topics, and to present to them uh, some of our latest research that we think may be of particular interest to that stakeholder um, community. Um, so we've got a lot of these networks, because as I say, they kind of match all of our different stakeholder groups. It takes a lot of effort. Um, it takes a lot of effort to, to, main, to maintain these, to, to organize these. Um, it takes a lot of effort sometimes to identify the right people to participate in them. Um, um, some of our networks uh, we built over slowly. Um, for example, our networks with representatives of the labor community and with representatives of the employer community. Um, we built slowly over time to try to make sure that we had people who were widely respected in those communities and were um, re um, interested in promoting the use of research evidence to inform workplace practice. Um, so it takes uh, a lot of effort um, to do that well, to maintain it, um, um, uh, and to grow it. Um, but as I said, we found that it's kind of foundational to everything else and that um, in our experience, it's really been worth the investment um, to uh, spend that time on relationship building. Um, one other comment I'll make on that before I go on is I, the importance um, of building relationships with more than one person, um, sometimes at more than one level of an important stakeholder organization, um, so that the relationships are resilient, right? So that, so that when somebody leaves, um, you haven't lost the relationship because you've lost the person. Um, so, so that's another reason why it takes a lot of effort because it, often what you're trying to do is build some thickness to the relationship so that it is resilient. Um, the second pillar, um, engaging um, knowledge users in the research process. Um, so again, that's similar to what Chris was talking about from the perspective of participating as a community organization or as a knowledge user organization. Um, um, and so what we try to do is consult with our, our stakeholders about emerging issues, consult with them before we're writing a grant application so that we can develop ideas for grant applications that we believe will be relevant to our stakeholders and that they will want to collaborate on. Um, and then um, we, we engage them in various stages of the research uh, process. Um, and I'm, I've got a slide coming up in a moment to outline that um, in more detail. Um, so I'm going to come back to that in a moment. Um, um, then um, the communicating uh, our findings, uh, the key thing there is, is the communicating uh, in plain language, um, uh, in using multiple vehicles. Um, using multiple channels. Um, so, um, so we prepare um, plain language articles about our research in our newsletters. We prepare one-page research summaries. So we have, we have summaries of different lengths, some of them one page, some of them a couple of pages. Our summaries of our systematic reviews are uh, about um, four to six pages. 
Um, so we have uh, our issue briefings are, are four pages. So we have different lengths of a summary of, of our work um, uh, in plain language uh, that we that we make available in different ways, you know, through our website, through Twitter, through our LinkedIn page, through our YouTube videos, um, short, very short YouTube videos. Um, um, uh, so, th and and we we surveyed our uh, our um, readers uh, a couple of years ago to sort of uh, identify how they like to um, connect with us, and we've used that. Uh, to help um, influence our, our design, our communication strategy. Um, and then the, uh, the uh, building capacity, to the final pillar about building the capacity to use uh, research. Uh, so we, we, there's various ways in which we've tried to enhance um, the, uh, the capacity of, of our knowledge users uh, to, to apply our research um, and to participate in our research projects, although I would say some of them have quite strong research skills without our help. Um, uh, so some of them are quite sophisticated uh, users of research, have a lot of research skills themselves. Um, but we do these other things in, try, in terms of trying to um, enhance that capacity. One very simple thing that we do that has been the most popular item on our website is a regular feature in our quarterly newsletter, which is what researchers mean by, like what do researchers mean by a randomized control trial, for example. Pick, pick a, a, a statistical term and then explain in plain language what does that really mean, give some concrete examples of how we've applied it in our research. That has been hugely popular. Um, but more substantially, um, what we have done is, is offer uh, workshops on research methods, in particular um, the, our uh, workshop on how to conduct systematic reviews, which has been offered um, two or three times a year, um, uh, very popular, um, uh, that takes people through um, the, the steps and methodology of, a, of, of doing a systematic review. Um, and my colleagues in the systematic review program here have also developed sort of short versions of that that can help um, knowledge users think about how to assess um, research articles that they see for quality, right? So that, so that they're approaching the use of research as an informed, um, as an informed reader uh, that, that, that can look at and assess to some extent, the quality of research articles that they're presented with. Um, and of course, our consultations with our stakeholders and our engagement of them in the research process, our practice of integrated KT itself builds capacity, right? People who have participated in our research projects are able to participate more deeply in subsequent research projects um, and, uh, and, uh, and move along this spectrum that, I've, that I'm putting up now. So what this slide is meant to do is to um, sort of convey the idea that you can think of stakeholder engagement not as a should I or shouldn't I or a yes, no, but really uh, how much, you know, uh, to what degree um, um, can, can one engage stakeholders in the research process. And so you can see on this spectrum uh, that um, on the one hand, um, you know, the kind of old-fashioned way of uh, researchers approaching stakeholder engagement would be a focus on dissemination, right? I'm just going to put out, you know, I've done this great work. Um, I'll make sure that it's available. I might ask some knowledge users to help me disseminate it, or I might not. I might just put it in a peer-reviewed journal and say, you know, it's in this peer-reviewed journal. You should read it. You should use it. Um, uh, so that's kind of the way in which um, researchers in the past and probably some in the present have, have you know, approached um, uh, knowledge translation. Um, and, um, but that tends not to work all that well um, for reasons that I probably don't need to uh, explain to the people participating in this uh, conference. Um, so that's kind of at the bottom end of the spectrum. Um, um, we try to stay away from that point on the spectrum. Um, the, the next point that I've got here is um, network members. Um, 
Uh, and so I talked about how um, we have these stakeholder networks that we need outside the confines of research projects to have a dialogue about knowledge exchange and about um, information gaps, research priorities, and so on. Um, and that can be very helpful in identifying future research topics. Um, but on its own, without the rest of this, um, doesn't, isn't really integrated KTE because it, it, you know, for integrated KTE to happen, we really need to have the stakeholders participating in the research projects themselves. Um, and so these other points um, on that spectrum are meant to illustrate uh, um, different forms of integrated KTE um, um, that are, you know, more more intense as you go as you move to the right. Um, so uh, often, what we will do um, is have multi-stakeholder advisory committees um, that will give advice about the conduct of our research at multiple stages of the project. So at the beginning, well, ideally, again, they would have been involved in helping to form the research question, uh, and 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 they would have been in, consulted in the development of the grant application. But once the project is underway, um, they would be involved. Um, you know, in uh, potentially in, in early in the early stage of the work in fine tuning the research process, or if it's a systematic review in helping to develop the search strategy, for example, um, they would be involved mid course in looking at you know how we're doing, what course corrections there might be needed. They might be helping us recruiting um, if if it's a, if it's a workplace intervention, and they would be involved um, near the end. Um, when we're getting ready to disseminate and we have our findings, but we're looking for their help on how to convert our findings into messages that will be um, well understood by the audiences that we are intending. Um, and our, we found that you know, stakeholders can be very helpful in telling us, don't use this word to communicate that finding because it will be misunderstood in our stakeholder community. You need to use this other phrase instead. So that, that kind of specific advice can often be very helpful in, in terms of the effectiveness of the, of the knowledge translation. Um, so so a, a multi-stakeholder advisory committee meeting at multiple stages of the project would be one example of integrated knowledge transfer and exchange. Sometimes, um, um, members of our stakeholder communities will be more active collaborators, um, you know, helping with the conduct of the research um, uh, and, uh, you know, more active participants in all stages of the research projects, uh, partners really in the conduct of the research. Um, so they might be collaborators or even co-investigators on a research grant. And in fact, um, in some cases, they have been co-principal investigators on a research grant application where they are co-leading the team, um, particularly some of our stakeholders who have worked with us in the past and who, who have developed really the capacity to co-lead research projects. We have engaged them, worked with them um, as partners uh, where they are co-leads of a, of a grant application. So that's to give you a sense of this idea of this um, spectrum of um, of knowledge engage uh, of not uh, sorry of stakeholder engagement. Um, um, so um, moving on, this is another way of looking at um, the different ways in which um, stakeholders um, can be uh, involved in different elements of the research. So when we talk about you know integrated KTE, again it's you know, stakeholders involved in identifying the emerging issues, developing the grant applications, fine-tuning the research strategies, reviewing draft findings, helping with the dissemination of results. Um, that, um, that typically our stakeholders would be involved in all or almost all of these um, stages in most of our uh, projects. Um, uh, but um, ongoing, um, so, so, the, so what you, in the center you have the stages of a of a particular project, um, but what you have ongoing all the time is our effort to build stakeholder networks and relationships, and build stakeholder capacity to uh, use to apply research evidence to use it critically. Um, so I'm going to um, uh, we should have time. 
at the end for plenty of questions. So I, rather than pause now for questions, I think what I will do is move on to talk for five or 10, uh, probably more like 10 minutes, but that should still leave us a good time for questions about our approach to measuring impact. Um, so we measure both reach and impact, right? Um, uh, reach, you know, the numbers of people who are, who, who are receiving our stuff and looking at it. Um, that's relatively easy to measure, but it's not really impact, right? Um, but, you know, there are people like numbers. Our board of directors likes numbers, you know? Um, so um, so we, we, we measure these things. We measure um, the number of people, you know, who come and look at our website. We measure the people who've downloaded products from our website, the number of people who subscribe to our e-newsletters, how many Twitter followers we have, how many retweets we're getting how many LinkedIn followers we have, how many people are viewing our YouTube videos. Um, you know, so we measure all of that. Um, but of course, that, that on its own doesn't really tell you about impact. It tells you that, yeah, there's some people that are, that are looking at your stuff or at least getting it. Um, and, and some of these metrics tell you that they're, that they're looking at it. Um, so we do all of that. Um, but in order to really get a sense of is our work being used to influence policy or practice to improve worker health and safety. I mean, that's what we're all about at the end of the day, right, is we, that we want to do research that improves outcomes for workers um, on, on, on worker health and safety. Um, um, and, it, and to do that, um, we frankly, what we largely do is tell stories. Um, we we uh, rarely try to quantify our impact we rarely try to, you know, identify what percentage of, of a knowledge user's initiative to improve health and safety is attributable to our research. Um, we don't really even try to do that. Um, what we do is we try to identify um, examples of uh, people who are um, organizations who are using our work to change policy or practice and then tell the story of, of how are they using it, what impacts are they seeing um, you know, among, among their clients or their members or their workers, um, um, and, and tell that story. Um, and there's different ways in which we, you know, we find these stories. We, we, we identify candidates for these stories. Um, some of it uh, occurs through the fact that we practice integrated KT, right? So because we have these multi-stakeholder advisory committees uh, and, and often we have, you know, we're collaborating uh, with um, key potential users of our research uh, as partners in the research process, um, that w when we're doing that, um, then that, of course, makes it easier to identify people who then take it up. Um, because um, people who participated in the process are much more likely to take it up and use it than people who have not participated in the process. There's actually even research evidence to uh, support that, particularly around the uh, use of research in the policy community. There are a number of um, papers, including a uh, systematic review of the literature on the use of research evidence by policymakers, by um, by Oliver and a colleagues of 2014 that, um, that you know, supports the idea that the extent to which you're doing integrated knowledge transfer and exchange, you're building relationships, you're engaging people in the research process, that that does improve uptake. Um, so, so, to, so to some extent, we are able to identify um, stories of impact through um, our advisory committees and research collaborations, but sometimes it's just through monitoring reports of policymakers, monitoring um, bulletins, newsletters, trade magazines, you know, of our in our stakeholder community, and and looking for um, examples where our work is being cited as having been influential, and then we'll 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 contact people and say, you know, we've seen your reference to our work. Can you talk to us? about, you know, how did you use our work, what changes do you make, you know, have you seen any outcomes yet, what sort of outcomes have you seen. Um, so we tell the stories. Um, and, uh, and we tell 
stories of three different types. Um, but um, uh, most of what we do in our storytelling is what, what shows up here is type two. Type one is, is really examples of where um, people, uh, we know that um, a lot of people are looking at our work. But we don't, may not know yet um, how it's being used. Um, but we know that a lot of people are looking at it. Um, an example would be um, um, there was a social marketing campaign some years ago by the German Social Accident Insurance um, uh, uh, Organization um, known by the German acronym DGUV. They had a social marketing campaign on the prevention of musculoskeletal disorders, and they cited the, that our research, our systematic reviews of the evidence on the prevention of musculoskeletal um, work injuries um, was influential in the design of their social marketing campaign, which then reached a lot of workplaces in Germany. Um, so we cited that as an example of diffusion of our work, although we didn't really know how it was being used in workplaces. Um, most of what we do is in the second um, type where we're telling stories about people who have used our work and, and maybe using other sources as well, but have used our work in an important way to, um, to make change in, in policies or programs or workplace practices or clinical practices. Um, and then the third type would be where we can identify final outcomes. We can identify that as a result of our work, injury rates have gone down or disability duration has gone down. Or people are getting back to work more quickly and staying back at work. You know, they're getting back to work in a sustainable way more quickly. Um, so, um, um, but that third type, we only have a few case studies on because that third type can take a very long time after the research is done in order for those kind of outcomes um, to, to happen. Um, and, you know, and, and it can be very difficult to track that your research at the end contributed to those changes. Although we have had a few cases where we have been able to um, track that sort of outcome where one of our clients has, um, or one of our user organizations has, you know, has used our research, has documented um, outcome, be beneficial outcomes in one or more of these areas has even quantified it. And then we'll cite their quantification of outcomes, but we won't attempt to indicate what percentage of it is attributable to our work. So in a way, we're still telling the story, but it may have some numbers. Um, so, um, so those are the sort of the three types of storytelling about impact that we do. Um, and, you know, it's, um, this is just another, a graphical representation of the same thing, but what, what this tries to get at is that, you know, it, it's harder and harder to attribute as you, as you move from people are looking at it to um, because of you, final outcomes have changed, right? It, it gets harder and harder to document that as you move to the right. So. Um, most of our work, as I said, has been on type two. We've been able to do some type three case studies. Um, and I'll give you just a few examples. Uh, I'm getting close to the end of my presentation, but I thought I'd give you a few examples of how, where we've documented impact, where we've told the story. Um, so we, we've, we've, uh, we have on our website summaries of these case studies. Um, and we started doing this about nine years ago, and we have 32 of these case studies posted on our, on our website. Um, um, so, you know, we have um, some in the area of prevention of work-related work musculoskeletal disorders. There's, there's um, a recent case of a large utility in Ontario, um, you know, a, a, a company providing um, electricity services to a large population segment in Ontario that um, cited um, uh, some of our work on par participatory ergonomics, you know, where, where you develop a, a team of people within the organization to identify ways to improve the prevention of musculoskeletal disorders. And they, they've talked about how, um, in light of our work, they've been able to sustain this participatory ergonomics team over time. It's built into their 
organization now and how they've really driven down their rates of musculoskeletal injury through sustaining this participatory approach to the prevention of, of MSD. So that would be one example. Um, another example is um, some of my colleagues have been involved in developing uh, and testing the measurement properties of various uh, so-called leading indicators of health and safety outcomes. So the idea here is to get beyond um, just injury rates, you know, so-called, or sometimes referred to as lagging indicators, right? That, you know, you look at them, you have the data after something bad has happened. Um, um, getting beyond things like injury rates, because sometimes they can be influenced by reporting problems, and trying to get at indicators, leading indicators of, of, of uh, health and safety outcomes. And um, so our, my colleagues have developed um, and tested several possible measures that can be used to do this, one of which has become quite popular because it has only eight questions in it. So it's very easy to use. And it was developed in collaboration with the health and safety associations that I referred to near the beginning of my presentation you know, who are dealing with, um, they're on the front line of, of, of working with workplaces to prevent work injury and illness. Um, so that tool has been sort of tested in terms of and, and found to be a, a reliable um, indicator that has predictive properties. And it's now being used, um, uh, it's being used by some workplaces in Ontario, um, but it's also being used by a number of jurisdictions across Canada as one sort of measure of safety culture that is seen as a leading indicator of outcomes. Um, the third one, um, uh, so a colleague of mine and a, and a team here that I was involved in um, developed a different way of looking at the notion of vulnerable workers in the context of occupational health and safety because a lot of the work had been looking at different demographic categories, you know, young people, um, immigrants, um, precarious workers. Um, and what we tried to do is develop a conceptual framework that kind of, you know, asked, well, what are the factors that are driving the higher injury rates that we see in these different demographic categories? Um, and, and basically, we developed a framework that, that sort of has a number of questions in a survey tool around um, exposure to hazards around the worker perception of the practices of their workplace, the worker perception of how well they are trained as part of that, the worker perception of their awareness of um, their rights and responsibilities and the risks associated with their job, and the worker perception of their empowerment, their ability to speak up and say, hang on, this is not safe. Um, so we've developed a survey instrument you know, rooted in that concept of vulnerability that has become, again, popular. Uh, some, some large employers are using it to better understand risks in their operation. Some um, jurisdictions are using it to, you know, as a tool to sort of under, try to get a profile of, of where uh, vulnerability is concentrated um, to, in their jurisdiction. Um, uh, the fourth one, we've done a lot of work around um, work accommodation, work, return to work practices. Um, in one case, um, um, there, there was a, um, the Workers' Compensation Authority in Ontario had noted that um, workers who were injured and not able to return to their previous employer uh, because of the severity of their injury, it prevented them from going back to doing the same kind of work they were doing before, they had, you know, programs to try to help those workers find employment uh, in, in other occupations and, and through other employers. And the, the re-employment rate uh, was very low. And, um, and so one of my colleagues did some research examining their, their process and those programs and, um, and identified a number of areas where there may be, um, that might be the reason for the low reemployment rate. Um, and that led to um, uh, a redesign of that program and ultimately much better reemployment rates. Um, and so we, you know, we wrote, we told the story of, of how um, our work influenced the change where you could actually document um, uh, better outcomes. 
Um, and the last one I'll mention is one where our work has not only changed some um, programs, um, but it's actually changed the discourse in Ontario and in some other parts of Canada, at least. Um, um, because uh, if you go back, oh, um, not even 10 years um, in Canada, um, there was, uh, and in Ontario in particular, um, there were annual uh, social marketing campaigns directed at young workers. Um, and they were rooted in data that, that showed that, you know, on average young workers were injured more often than older workers were. And so there was a lot of social marketing activity on a regular basis that was targeted at young workers. Um, but then some of my colleagues did some research to try to understand better what's driving that. Is it because they're young, that they're immature in some way? Or are there other things going on? And, um, and so they identified, first of all, that young workers tended to be in more hazardous occupations. But they also identified that, um, that the, the injury rates um, were, um, the, 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 the higher injury rates that we were seeing for young workers were primarily driven by them being in the first month of the job, being inexperienced, not being young. Um, and that people who were older, people who were, say, age 45, but also in the first month on the job, had equally elevated um, risk profiles for, for work injury, as did young workers, um, so that it wasn't actually about being young. It was about being new. That, it, that first month on the job was the problem. It wasn't being 20 years old or a teen. Um, and that really changed the discourse um, um, from, uh, and changed the social marketing campaigns here from young workers to new and young, or sometimes just new workers. So those are just some examples of where we've had impact. And really, for the most part, what we've done is I, you know, talk to people who have used our work and, um, and try to tell the story of how they used it, what changes they made, and where there's outcome data, typically from them, not us, um, um, you know, what those outcomes uh, were. Um, so so that's, that's basically our story of measuring impact. Um, I'm going to open it up for questions in just a moment, uh, but I do want to acknowledge that we operate with the support of the province of Ontario, um, but they don't necessarily agree with everything we say. Um, and a couple of other things I just want to point out. Um, uh, these are various ways in which you can find our stuff. Um, the best way is the first one. If you're not already getting our, our e-alerts, our very brief monthly e-alert or our quarterly uh, e-newsletter, you can sign up for it. There's also a sign up on the front page of our website. Um, uh, you can follow us on Twitter, connect with us on LinkedIn. You can watch our YouTube videos. Um, but if you want to use our stuff, please don't use it for profit or, or change it without contacting us. <laughs> um, um, uh, and that is about it, I think. Yes. Um, so um, I will maybe leave up that slide and open it up, I guess, for questions at this point. Well, thank you very much, Ron. Um, we actually are getting close to the top of the hour, but we do have um, one question that was asked earlier on. And let me see if I can go back to it now. <laughs> Sorry about that. Lisa asks, how do you ensure stakeholder groups, networks, meetings are including new members or champions? Um, well, yeah, that, that is a good question. One of the ways I guess we try to do that is from time to time we talk to existing um, members of these groups about um, you know, who are uh, a new uh, people in their stakeholder communities that are that are emerging as champions in those communities. So we do we do some kind of snowball type recruiting that way, where we build on our existing relationships to try to recruit um, new members. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Ron. We do have a couple of more questions, but we are out of time. Where we need to go to our break. Uh, so we want to thank you very much for your presentation, and we'll look forward to bringing those questions to you when we get back uh, to the discussion session at the end of the day.
So now we're going to go for a 30-minute break. The chat box will remain open during this time, so everybody feel free to keep chatting. And when we return at 3.30 Eastern, the next presenter will be Jennifer Flagg. Thank you. <laughs>